Hey everybody, welcome to Right On, the podcast from Final Draft. This is the show where we talk about all things screenwriting. I'm your host, Phil Galasso. Today's interview is with Eliza Schlesinger, writer, producer, and star of the new movie Good on Paper. In the film, after years of putting her career first, a stand-up comic meets a guy who seems perfect. Smart, nice, successful, and possibly too good to be true. I always respected that you weren't obsessed with your marriage. It was okay that you hadn't reached all your goals by the age of 35. Wow. Yeah? I'm 34. Do you look 35? <gasps> a salty 35. That compliment started great and just... For me, the story was not about love at first sight. But you're a comedian, right? Andrea Singer. I've seen you before. And what do you do? Hedge funds. I got this Yale alumni event I have to go to. What's a Yale? Oh, Yale is a prestigious school. I'm fucking and... with you. Yeah, I know what Yale is. <laughs> <laughs> he seemed nice, normal, like a, an accountant who loves missionary. I want you to be my girlfriend. You are so witty and sexy. You're exquisite. In that moment, I didn't want to be with anyone but him. You don't really know anything about him, do you? I mean, you know that he bought a house months ago. So where is it? Beverly Hills. But like, where is it specifically? Beverly Hills. You ever notice that he always has the perfect answer for everything? Absolutely. 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 Yeah! I'm taking Dennis to meet my cousin Brett. It's a big step. It's a big step. Andrea said you played at Yale. Come on, baby, show him how it's done. Oh my god, oh. I'm so old. Oh, this is so embarrassing. My father has a bad back, I have a bad back. My back isn't hereditary. We both got in a car accident. And you both hurt your back in the same exact We both hurt our backs in the same place. Dennis is a cuttlefish. A lesser cuttlefish mate with the females under false pretenses. So it's like catfishing, but worse. Cuttlefishing, I love that. I got you in my sights. We should get him drunk and make him confess. I got you, girl. Let's ride. Felt quite the iron stomach during the Yale years. Now that he's here, y'all could work it out. He is unconscious. Was that your plan? Eliza and guest host Sade Sellers discussed making the jump from stand-up to screenwriting, how she carves out time to write from her extremely busy touring schedule, knowing when to take feedback and when to stick to your gut, and more. Check it out. Hey everyone, welcome to the Write On Podcast. I am Charday. I'm back with a special guest today, the writer and star of Good On Paper, Eliza Schlesinger. Hey Eliza. Hi. Hi. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing fabulous. I really enjoyed your film as a 31-year-old woman myself. A lot of reminiscent relationships in that, in that piece. It was kind of hurtful to watch, but also really amazing. My first question is generic screenwriting questions because all of our listeners here are mostly screenwriters. I'd like to know what the process was to take your stand-up and transcribe it out into a feature film. Sure. So the stand-up, I mean, are you referencing that there's stand-up in the movie yeah. or- Okay, sure. So interestingly enough, the bulk of the stand-up in the movie, I improvised on the spot. We knew that Andrea was a stand-up and we were showing her doing stand-up. So I had some light premises written down, but I came up with the majority of that because they were just quick snippets that you only needed really to broach. Uh, you only needed to broach a premise. And there's a couple of small punchlines. And interestingly enough, I ended up using a lot of those jokes in real life after. So we definitely had it carved out and, you know, I've been transcribing stand up for years. So that was super easy. And that's, that's the story of that. That's the genesis of that stand up. Are you, did you take any classes? Are you trained or is there something that you just naturally gravitated towards the screenwriting? So I've been this, you know, I've been writing scripts for years. This is, I've written several screenplays and I've written several TV pilots as well. So I'm, you know, self-taught. I remember a fr actually Ross and Thurber, <laughs> critically acclaimed director Ross and Thurber. I met him years ago and he was always super cool to me. He gave me my first copy of Final Draft oh, wow. because I, I think I had like written a script in like Word, <laughs> you know, because you don't know. There's no rules for these things when you start. And he was kind enough to give that gift that to me. You know, I look back at the first screenplay I wrote just and the technical aspect of it. And each time you write, you get better and better. And the more screenplays you read, the more things you audition for, you see what you do and don't, uh, what doesn't translate. So yeah, I'm completely self-taught. 
And nice. it is a skill to be able to think something and actually verbalize it and also write it down. They're like separate things. So I love that. I didn't go to school either. And I, I have a, a special affinity for people who should just kind of toss themselves into things and teach themselves. Absolutely. Um, I want to ask on this project is you didn't direct this, but you did star and write in it. So how did you find that, that director that you felt was like, okay, this, this person's going to take care of the work that I just put in for this script. I mean, I think especially being a standup, you know, you're so close to your material and I wanted someone who could shepherd it. I didn't want some, you know, it is collaborative, but you want someone who will serve and service the work. This isn't an action movie where you can come in with all these crazy ideas. And it is a simple film. This, you know, we don't have any, many, at least special effects. You know, this, we didn't write Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. This is (laughs) a rom-con with a twist. Um, But it was sort of my opus at the time. You know, we just took some general meetings and I always, as a true feminist, I always want the best person for the job. And I don't care what that person looks like. And in this case, Kimmy Gatewood came in the most prepared, understood it the most. And I think there are plenty of men out there who could have understood it. So this wasn't as if only women can relate to this. She just like everything in Hollywood gave the best pitch was willing to give it the most. And really, we really connected on story and intention and motivation and things like that. I found it the easiest to talk to her and she got the gig because she gave the best general (laughs) and the best pitch. Yeah. I love that. And I'm not, this is not a spoiler podcast. So listeners, don't worry. I'm not going to spoil the film, but it does take an unexpected turn towards Mm -hmm. the midpoint. Did you always know your film was going to lead that way when you were writing it, when you're outlining it, or did you just, did it just happen? Sans happen? I did. I always knew there was going to be a twist and this story we're touting it as a mostly for legal reasons, a mostly true story based on a lie because this actually did happen to me. The bulk of the movie actually did happen to me. Oh, wow. And the twist gives way to, you know, at the time, a little bit of a revenge fantasy. And when I remember when I wrote it thinking, if this has happened to anyone, they will cheer for our hero because she gets to exact this type of contorted revenge that maybe doesn't work out. So often in our lives, you know, you go through something, whether it's you get screwed over in business or by a friend or by someone you're dating and that's it. Like you just yeah. walk away with the hurt. And I was like, this shouldn't be a movie where th- that's all about her heartbreak. This should be about trying to hold someone accountable. And so it's a bit of that revenge fantasy for anyone that never got to ask why or talk it out or process it. I, I did it for you. Uh, and I felt that. The most grounded way I could. <laughs> no, I, I, I felt that. I don't want to give anything away about just, like I said, some parallelisms in my life of lies being told are, uh, was really great to see cathartically your character. I appreciate that because it was a cathartic process. You know, this happened, I processed it and mentally where I was when I started chipping away at this, you know, in the early, in the wee hours of the morning versus where I am as a human. Now there's no anger. You know, the last thing I wanted to do was contribute to any mis nomers and misinformation about a woman's scorn. This movie at its heart is about a very normal girl who accidentally came into contact with a scorned man. And it's about how people who feel inadequate take out and exact their revenge on people who don't deserve it. I didn't want to create a girl who was vulnerable or had it coming or needed to grow. Most women are more like Andrea than Hollywood gives us credit for. And I didn't want a character arc where she's like humbled. I wanted it to be like, no, you made her, she made her own money, had her own career, didn't deserve this. And here's how it played out. And I absolutely love that because you're right. I hate the kind of wounded, weak animal tropes that we get played where we're like, no, we're we're pretty strong and tough on our own. Like she made a mistake. She trusted someone she shouldn't have. We've all been there. And I love how she recruits. So you mentioned earlier, you, this isn't your first screenplay you've written. You've, you've got others, but why, what this one in particular is, is coming out soon. It's getting made. The others, where are they living? Are they still on your computer? Are they in process? The others are, are written and at various stages of ones with a director. We have one or two actors attached. One is in the hands of a, an executive at a not to be named network, <laughs> uh, actually, okay. you know, and then I've, you know, uh, sort of consulted on some others. And then there's always that script in your back pocket because I really enjoy the process of, of screenwriting. I really enjoy writing my own jokes, my own material, my own vehicles for me to star in. So this one was just something I chipped away at. And I, 
I enjoyed for a few years having it as that thing I could go home to when I felt mm. my career was, wasn't something I was controlling. You know, you don't get the audition. You don't fill up the theater or the room. Somebody says, no, you get rejected. You don't get the gig. And there was a little fire in me that was excited to be able to go home. And I was like, these people don't know that I'm quietly working on a script and it's actually going to get made. You'll see. <laughs> no, that's awesome. And I do want to ask you about that because you have so much going on. When I was looking at your resume and, and all the things you're doing online, I was like, I don't know how this person sleeps, let alone writes a script. So do you have any advice for screenwriters who are just starting maybe their career who have to work survival jobs like we all had to do at the sure. beginning of how to squeeze in that time? You know, you got to, tr- I mean, part of me wants to be like, you got to treat it like a job. That being said, like I have a book due and I keep putting it off, which you can't <laughs> do to a job. And so everybody has different study habits and we all see the people sitting at Soho house or sitting at a coffee mm-hmm. shop writing. I can't do that. I wasn't the cool kid that could like do my homework with the TV on. Like I need silence. I need a chunk of time. Mm-hmm. And so for me, it's always about carving that out. I can't, work for a little bit and then go take a call. Like I need to pour myself into it, even if it's only for an hour. And so there is something to be said for creating that right environment, Mm -hmm. having no distractions and wanting to write it. I'm not, you know, I don't have any like pretentious advice other than what's inside of you. It should burn. Like it needs to come Mm -hmm. out like an infection, (laughs) like you pour it onto the page and it comes in spurts like blood. It's not, you know, you're not going to sit down and bang out the whole thing. And if you did, I'd love to know what you were on. Um, (laughs) And sometimes you take a couple days and you come back and don't ask everyone for feedback. Right. Because I remember we screened this for a few friends, like before we were done editing and there were a couple of good notes, but one of the big notes was take out the stand up. And in my heart, I was like, I want that narrative device. Yeah. So there's, there's getting critical feedback and then there's following your gut. So only repetition unearths which road you should take, I suppose. And then uh, to you, what's the difference between writing a joke on the page and saying it live and in person? Well, someone's going to have to say that joke that's on the page and something as a person who's been auditioning for comedies for a decade, sometimes I read a joke and I actually sort of poke fun at this in the opening of my of the movie of good on paper, because sometimes I'm like, did the writer say this joke out loud? Yes. That scene in the, the audition room. Yeah. <laughs> that was and very this is, I, you know, this is definitely not a, uh, you have to be a careful as a woman to criticize anyone. Right. But sometimes I read stuff and I'm like, did you say this? Because nobody speaks like this. Right. And even the pattern within this joke, you know, as a comic, you're so sensitive to cadence and syllables. And those really can make or break someone laughing or not laughing. Something can still be funny, but nobody laughed. So, and then there's also putting it in other people's voices. There's the way that I speak, which is the way that Andrea speaks. And, you know, a note that I've gotten is everybody sounds the same. So really trying to give everybody their own, it's up to the actor to bring it to life, but give everybody their own point of view. And then for you, I think, I think what you said is great, especially because of that scene, the opening scene, I don't want to spoil it, but it, it was as someone. Spoil it. Spoil well, it. No, the rule of threes is just like, yeah, why, why aren't we doing this? And, I'll spoil and then, it. Yeah, I'll go ahead it. and spoil it. <laughs> or actually, if you, I mean, if you want to, if you want to say it, I'd love to hear somebody else describe it, but if you. If All right. You well, no, it. Andrea's in a, an audition room and she's, she's doing a piece of comedy piece and she delivers the lines and there's periods where there shouldn't be. And she casually mentions to the people at the audition, whether it's producers or writers director, that she do the rule of threes and make it this way. And they kind of dismiss her. And then when she's gone, they go, yeah, we should do it this way. She's like, I don't like how she said it though. She's mean. Yeah. And that was really great. Mean. Yeah, Thank that you. was really great. Cause I've yeah, definitely the, gotten that. Yeah, the amount of times in auditions, they're like, make it your own. And so you kind of got to change the words a little to make it flow. And then you see what's done on camera and you're like, oh, that girl just read it the same way. And yep. it's not, you know, so I am a, a harsh critic when it comes to, act, to pure comedy. I do. I, I scrutinize everything. When you're on set and you're working with your director and you're, I, I assume also you're friends with these actors as well that are in the, in the film. Cause you, your I, relationship, your chemistry were really great. Oh, thank you. You know, that's a testament to those actors. And I guess to me in a way that like, you know, I wanted to create a nice environment. Yeah. I've been on sets where 
number one is in a good mood. So everybody's in a good mood. And I've been on sets where it's miserable and the main actor wants everyone to be miserable and it really does trickle down. And so, you know, I didn't know Ryan going into the movie, but it's like being on set with a golden retriever that never stops making you laugh. <laughs> yeah. uh, and especially as a comic, I was just like, oh no, like what if he's like annoying, funny? And he was so funny and down and cool. And Margaret Cho is I mean, agreeable, makes it sound like there isn't more to her. She's so on board. The answer is always yes. She's on time. Like it's easy. And that's all you want. Yeah. We don't want actors that are going to go off book and go nuts. We don't want people with egos. You know, it was just a very easy, cool set. And Kimmy Gatewood had a lot to do with that. Like she was cool with her crew and we were all, I gave every actor, I want, I gave them all fun lines. I didn't want to waste anybody's time. I didn't want anyone to be annoyed that they were at work, you know, probably for very little money and not getting <laughs> to be creative. So I, I gave everybody creative license and it was super collaborative and we got through it. It was a tough shoot just because it was short, you know, you don't have a ton of money, but we were all there in service of that script and comedy. And I guess ultimately me and all you can do is treat your actors well. And they treated me well. I, I love that because it does start at the top and it does trickle down. I'm a huge proponent of that. And you said that, you know, you small budget, you had a tight time. So is there room for improv for yourself always. at least? Always. Always. Okay. <laughs> always. You know, Ryan's character, Dennis, isn't, he's funny because he's awkward, but he's not, you know, he's very straight laced. You know, the script was written in, it's, it's such a, it's so my voice that anything I would improvise often was already written on the page, mm -hmm. but you know, you have that talk with your director and I would always be like, okay, let me just do one extra take, you know, let's just see yeah. how it looks in the edit. You know, you always want to get those ideas out there. And in the moment, sometimes something doesn't work that you were positive would work or you're not feeling it. So there's always room for improv and it's always welcome as long as it's not taking up the whole day. We don't need any long form mumblecore improv. It's exactly. <laughs> Show I think Judd Apatow in his masterclass was like, I always get what's on the page first. And then it's like, yeah, the last one, sure. is for you guys, whatever you want to sure. do. We'll yeah. make it work. Or in this case, since I wrote it, I'm like, let's just get whatever I think is funny first. And then we'll, right. <laughs> then we'll do it. Well, no, sometimes you got, sometimes oh, you got to throw out something. You'd be like, this paragraph doesn't work anymore. Right. You know, so you have to be open. It is a living, breathing thing. And you have to, I mean, I was on a, I was on a movie uh, not that long ago where we cut like a one -er, like an 11 page one -er that mm. morning, mm. you know, cutting out pages. Most of them were my scenes, but pages and pages of dialogue, like in the moment. And it's, it's, it's like watching an animal be slaughtered in front of you or like my lines. So it's all, well, you know, it's interesting you say that because the freedom of that, that comes with obviously being a producer and being an actress on your own film. Most screenwriters, we don't get those options. Absolutely. <laughs> they're going to totally. gut what they're going to gut and you're just going to have to like, ooh, sink it in. Yeah. Um, how do you handle maybe a note that, like you said earlier, your friend said, I really think you should cut the co live stand comedy out. And you said, no, how do you know when, okay, I need to meet in the middle with these people or no, I'm really going to, hold my guns to this one. Like, this is the one I need to stick by. The truth is it's ultimately up to you. Now I gathered my friends in my home and, and asked them, I was like, you can be honest. Cause you want that honest feedback. You don't want your friends to be like, it's great. Good job. <laughs> you know? And, and it was so kind that they took the time to critique you. You know, nobody in Hollywood will ever tell you you suck. I mean, <laughs> they might, but like <laughs> people take the time to say you should do something else. We're all terrified that the person who sucks is going to become famous. So it's like, just be nice, just in case. Nobody, I, I see this in comedy all the time. There are comics who are terrible, but A, I don't want to be the one that says quit because they could become great. You right. don't want to be the reason that they commit themselves to a mental hospital. And like, what is that, ser how does that actually serve you? I can understand if it's a parent telling a kid like, look, I love you and this isn't a good idea. But most people won't do you the courtesy of giving you feedback. I can say that having audition, you know, and you're like, why didn't I get it? I, I, I don't, I don't understand. And no, we loved you. You were great. And yep. they'll never tell you, you weren't that great. Or you gave a weird vibe or you read poorly. You'll never get that feedback. So it is invaluable to get people to be honest. And I just took it with a grain of salt. I was, I have no ego weirdly when it comes to writing and collaboration and notes. So I knew that they were a lot of their notes were great, but I knew that I wanted that voiceover and I knew that it was something unique. Yeah. We so rarely show women doing stand up. 
And for years, I, you know, we pitch shows like it's the Eliza show and it's, I'm, I'm a comic in LA. And the answer was always no. And all of these mm-hmm. men got their sitcoms where they were stand ups. Yep. yep. And nobody could wrap their mind around it. And then all of a sudden, Marvelous Miss Maisel. And yeah. Then hacks. And yeah. so maybe it's just the right uh, executive, right time. But I was just like, it's something that I've been fighting for forever. I'm like, you need to show a woman standing on the stage because yeah. that is what I do. I'm not a writer. I'm not a teacher. I do this just as well as any of the guys. And I deserve to be able to say it. So that was very important that. for me. Yeah. Well, th- good for you. You know, sometimes <laughs> you have to stand up for yourself and yeah, you may get the bitch connotation, but you were right in this sense. Cause I actually really enjoyed the merging of Andrea doing stand up and telling her life story and we get to see it as well. I think well, that we was used brilliant. It. Thank you. You know, you, it had a purpose. It was a narrative device and yeah, that sort of VO and I'm a big fan of voiceover. People hate it, but they're wrong. I mean, <laughs> is Martin Scorsese wrong? No. Is Goodfellas wrong? No. And so it, it served a purpose and it turns out the whole time she was telling this story from beginning to end. So I, we just liked it. I thought it was the perfect way to do that. But, uh, I was happy that my friends gave me feedback on other things. And these are all, if you can shed your ego and just take the pure criticism, it's a, a beneficial thing. Well, soon millions of your friends uh, will be giving you feedback on the film. Yeah, a lot of heart <laughs> emojis, a lot of thumbs up emojis. Well, are you um, are you anticipating that or are you prepared for that? Like, you know, opinions or hopefully, you know, people love it as much as I did. But are you prepared for both sides? I've had, I've interviewed people where they go, you know, they you prepare for the negative, but you never really prepare for your like imposter syndrome when people really like your stuff. I mean, I'm a stand-up comic. I'm always prepared for the negative and I've had my fair (laughs) share of it. You know, it's so easy to write someone off or discount someone. And, you know, I've read the comment section. I've read the articles, but usually it rings hollow. It usually just comes from people who don't like that you showed up because they couldn't show up. And at the end of the day, this was an honest attempt at art. And this was a unique story. And this was me turning, taking control of something quasi tragic and turning it into something positive and funny and relatable. And at the end of the day, Universal and Netflix liked what I made and we we did it. And that's more than some people will get in a lifetime. So I think people are going to, I hope they watch it. I hope women see themselves in it. I hope guys all rally around disliking Dennis because, you know, (laughs) betas are gross. God, I hope um, they do, right? (laughs) Yeah, but in the end, I think it's a unique story and I think it's funny. And I think I gave these characters fun things to do. And there's action and there's a little bit of gore, which I love. I wanted more vomit. They made me cut it. Um, Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It really takes a twist in that third act. You're like, oh, this is now, I'm not going to say it because then- it will give it away. But all right. I want to ask you one, one last question. And we ask all our guests in the podcast here, and it is what advice would you give your younger writer self? And that could be comedy writing. That could be screenwriting. It's funny. Cause I would give this to myself, but even now I find it hard to do. And that is read more scripts, but I find that so difficult. Like <laughs> I started reading, save the cat. I was like, this is boring. Like I'm a very like hands-on kind of person. And it is, it does take practice to watch a movie, to look for good directing, to look for the editing, you know? So practice makes perfect. God, I'm just thinking back to like a script I had with a big producer and like, I just, they kept giving notes and I just didn't have the skill to get it over the line. But I also was like headlining clubs every weekend. So you got to put in your 10,000 hours somewhere. So I guess my only advice is write what you know write what you know, and whatever that story is, whether it's about cancer, whether it's about your race, your gender, your whatever it is, even if it seems like you shouldn't be writing about it, if it's something you lived and you experienced, and this is my rule for comedy, it's yours. Mm. Some you like somebody tried to kill you. You were in an accident. You lost your hand. You have a disease. You know, it's a race thing. If it happened to you, it's yours. That's the only upside of something bad. And so as long as it comes from an honest place, no one can take that away from you. Well, that was beautifully said. I don't (laughs) think we could do any better than that. So, all right, everyone, Good On Paper comes out on Netflix June 23rd, very soon. I'm super excited for you. I'm excited for everyone else to see this film that I loved. Eliza, you're 
doing amazing things. I can't, I mean, I can't wait to see what else you're going to do next, but you're everywhere. So I can, I will see I you probably that. tomorrow night watching the award show. So I had so much fun on this writer's podcast. This was, yeah. I feel so official. Thank you. A little you. different, right? Like not Great. so much. Great. I'm glad we could make it work. And I'm really excited to have meet, met you. You made, like you said, a beautiful piece of art that was really reflective and makes my 31 year old self feel a little bit, not so isolated. I'm like, oh, okay. Other people are actually having horrible dates too. Great. You'd be surprised how many people are. You're not alone. I promise. It feels like it's an attack on Bumble and me, but it's it's not just me. (laughs) You guys, this has been another episode of Ride On. Please watch the movie on June 23rd on Netflix. Good on paper. Eliza, nice to meet you. I will see you guys next time. Bye-bye. Thanks again to Eliza Schlesinger for coming on the show. And thanks as always to Sharday Sailors for hosting. Good on paper will be available to stream on Netflix on June 23rd. And as always, thanks to you, our listeners. If you liked this episode, leave us a review. And if you haven't already, subscribe on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. For news about future episodes and more, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Final Draft Inc. and Instagram at Final Draft Screenwriting. This episode was produced by Kayla Guess with help from associate producer Emma Vranich. Music by T. Kelly. Thanks again, everyone. Until next time, right on. Right on.